okay? Let me just preface. As an adoptee myself, when I first read The Primal Wound, it felt like my Bible. And for all fellow adoptees, when they read The Primal Wound, they feel so connected to this book. It becomes somebody finally understands me and knows who I am. And, and it becomes the adoptee Bible. And every adoptee, so many adoptees read it today. It's a theory. So can we clarify your, how you define the primal wound by Nancy Verrier? Because when I read your book, it, it was fascinating to me. Because as a therapist as, and as an adoptee, I've always believed in this theory. And then I go, wait a second, Michael's helping me see this differently. And so there's mixed thoughts about this theory. Can you sure. elaborate? I'd be glad to. First of all, let me tell you what I like about the book. What I yeah. really like about, about uh, the primal wound is exactly what oh, you just said. Yeah. Oh, okay. start again. I'm sure. What I really like about Nancy Verrier's book, The Primal Wound, is exactly what you just said. And that is that it captures, for some adoptees, the experience of pain and grief and loss that so many others have denied to them. And in that sense, it's a very important and moving book. I was moved as I read it. So I'm... In no way do I want to diminish that because I accept it and I acknowledge it and I think it is an important statement that she's made in being able to describe some of the grief, loss, and pain, shame, that many adoptees have experienced. Having said that, I think that her explanation of that experience and the ways in which one can move forward from that position are, are flawed. And the reason I say that is because her model is based on a notion of attachment, very popular term today, mm -hmm. in which one creates a working model out of an early experience, the experience of loss and separation, from first parent and the child who's about to be adopted. And that one carries that model into every relationship from that point forward. And that the only form of healing is the reconnection between first parent and adoptee. Think of this for in terms of what we've been talking about so far. It says now, that everything wrong with in the experience of adoption is grounded inside the adoptee as a cognitive and emotional working model in which you can't trust people, you can't rely on people, you can't really be an authentic and genuine person with others because you've had this model since birth and you carry it for the rest of your life, only to be changed after reunion. Well, first of all, reunion doesn't always bring joy. Sometimes it brings pain. I, I, I believe with my whole being that everyone should have the right to that experience of meeting first family and hopefully is successfully being integrated into that family. So no problem there for me. But I look from a, the perspective of a systemic understanding that the adoption constellation ideas br bring forward, that the way a person thinks about themselves is affected by social attitudes of the society, the openness of adoptive parents in terms of how they talk about adoption and what they'll say, whether in fact you're accepted by a wider circle of people, grandparents, cousins, aunts, uncles, neighbors, teachers, religious leaders, whatever, it's affected by your hormones, 
It's affected by your genetics. And the research shows clearly that the relationship between one's early experience and the predictability of later behavior, that the relationship is, first of all, weak. It's not a strong relationship. And secondly, it only is early experience is only predictive of later experience when the world you live in never changes, when the context in which you live your life stays consistent. Think of, for example, a, uh, a mom who is depressed after birth and remains depressed. Then the child will be a child of a depressed parent with all of the psychological ramifications of what that means. I don't have time to go into that now, but I know you know, I am certain you understand what I'm saying. If that parent gets the kind of help, let's assume, for example, they get on the right medication, they have a good therapist, uh, they find a secure job, life, they move into a better neighborhood, economically their work, life is better, all of a sudden the relationship between the child and the parent changes and so does the attachment relationship changes because the context in which that dance between parent and child goes on has now changed. It's a different context than the early one. So taking all of that into consideration, it seems to me that the way that we help folks is we help them to create a narrative, a self-understanding, which takes them from being a person who has been victimized by circumstance, victimized by professionals who don't know what they're talking about, victimized by bad attitudes of so many. I mean, the, the stories I've heard of adoptive parents sometimes saying to kids, you should be grateful to me because your mother was a slut. That doesn't bring love and closeness. <laughs> it doesn't work. <laughs> so what we have to do is we have to think about what kind of narrative the person has. Most adoptees' narratives are have no coherence, no connection, no cause and effect relationship over time for the simple reason that they've been denied the information that tells them who they are. You come to my office and say, you knock at the door. And I say to you, you know what, Jeanette? I have something really important to tell you, but I'm busy now. I'm not, I don't have time to tell you now. And you're going to claw at me until I at least give you an idea of what I'm talking about. Well, that's what the experience of being without information is all about. It's not primal wound. It's the fact that none of us can walk in the world with a deficient narrative, a narrative that lacks an understanding that takes us from the moment of conception. Well, not too much detail there, but from the moment of conception mm -hmm. until our current moment. Yeah. Because we have to know how we got here. And the only yeah. way you're going to know how you got here is to be able to have full and complete information about your history. Everybody should have that right. Mm -hmm. You have to be able to feel like you can have a full identity that makes sense. You have to be able to feel like you have control in your life. You have to recognize that you're not acting out when in fact you're experiencing grief, loss, and loss. You have to not feel shame because other people have shamed you for being second rate, being adopted and not consanguineous of the same blood. Mm -hmm. All of these things are dimensions that Sharon Roja, an extraordinary educator in adoption, has taught us about what it means to be adopted. These are the dimensions of your story, of your narrative, how you place yourself within that story. Now, one last one. It's one that I think we have forgotten about more than any other. And that's yes. the one I added to her list. And that is mattering. Adoptees need to feel that they matter to other people. Let me tell you a very quick story. Yeah. An adoptee said to me, I'm a super athlete. My dad was his adopted dad. My dad is a klutz. 
The guy can't walk three feet without falling over his feet. Mm -hmm. He comes to every one of my football games. And he's the biggest supporter of me. Even though he hates football, hates sports, but he loves me. That father was saying to that son, you matter to me. And what happens to you matters to me. And that adoptee could say to that adoptive parent, you matter to me because I matter to you. I think that at the heart of successful adoption is that we treat each other in a way that we have mutual mattering between us. And then it extends out from adoptive parents to siblings and to cousins and aunts and uncles and particularly grandparents. And when we do this, we can create a narrative in which you can feel a sense of wholeness when you have information. You can move from point to point in your life saying, I understand how I went from here to there to there. I saw a young woman in therapy. I'm not going to give any disclosing information, but she had come from a foreign country. She was a founder on the steps of a hospital in which there was no possibility of her ever being able to trace her roots. She was depressed. She had committed, attempted suicide. She was self-cutting. Mm -hmm. I said to her, I don't understand this because you tell me you're not worth anything because you were left on the steps. But you've forgotten that the woman who gave birth to you did the only thing she could do in a circumstance in which no one supported her. And she took you to the only place where you would be safe, the steps of a hospital, where you had any chance of survival whatsoever. You come from DNA that's not weak, but strong. You come from a place where you mattered, even if she wasn't able to be your, to, to, to fulfill the full role of parenting you over your lifetime. You carry within you, in your cells, the stuff that of courage and strength. Yes. And when I said that to her, the floodgates opened. She couldn't stop crying. And when she did, she said, I never thought of myself that way. I always thought I was a castaway, not worth anything. But we even deny adoptees the history that will allow them to not feel that way. Yes. Beautiful. Just beautiful. Just, it's so, it helps us see our strength, our ancestry, and that we're connected to something far greater than ourselves. Exactly. So what I'm, what I'm saying to you, Jeanette, is that if, if we think of ourselves as simply flawed people, and that's the end of the story until reunion, and reunion right. doesn't always solve a lot of things. Right. Nope. It solved it. It solved some. I I I had I I was working with someone who who knocked at the door, knocked at the door and said, "Hi, I'm your 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 child." <laughs> and the woman looked, took one look at her, slammed the door, and said, "I should have aborted you," and slammed the door in her face. Mm -hmm. Reunion can be that way. Very rarely, thank goodness, very rarely. Mm -hmm. But the point is, reunion doesn't always solve things. Because sometimes one finds that the situation, the context in which one was originally placed for adoption, is the uh, that situation remains, and that's a hard, that's a bitter pill to take. But can I deal with one other issue? If, if sure. we have, I hate the term "giving up for adoption." Yes, you talk about that. It drives me crazy. Okay, why? Because it, it implies immediately, oh, I, I gave her up. I cast her away. I cast him away. It, that person has nothing 
it meant nothing to me. And so you say, I was given up for adoption. Like I wasn't worth keeping. But again, I have to refer back to my friend Sharon Roja, who has yeah. taught us that when you say giving up for adoption, this is what it means. It means that you gave up fighting the sperm source. We might want to call it the, the, the first father, but we, <laughs> we gave up fighting him to have him stand up and be responsible. And we gave up fighting with our parents who refused to support us. And we gave up fighting the social worker who wouldn't fight for us, but was fighting for people who wanted to adopt our child. And we gave up fighting the, the lawyers because we didn't have our own lawyer who could stand up and defend our rights. And we gave up fighting the judge because he was part of a system where the law gave all the power to someone else and not to us. And finally, that young woman takes her child and gives it up to people who have more power above her than she has. So I think it's a highly disparaging term. I hope we can eliminate it from adoption in our adoption thinking, because we have to, I, I, I struggle for what a better way of talking about it is. And I, you, you've heard me say throughout this whole uh, interview that uh, I've talked about a, a child who was placed for adoption, didn't say who placed that child, or that an adoption plan was made for that child, but it doesn't say who made that plan. Mm-hmm. But or a, a plan was made for that child mm-hmm. to be put into an adoptive family. But we have to say we have to stop saying that first parents gave up their children. Oftentimes they were caught in circumstances where they had no choice. And we have to respect that. And if we respect that, it also makes adoptees feel like they're not castaway goods, but in fact, somebody tried to do the best they could for that child, that child mattered to that person. 